Okay, thanks, Michelle, and, and thanks everyone for joining us today uh, for today's webinar with regard to increasing transparency of products' environmental impacts through the use of product categories and environmental product declarations. So before we, we get started today, I'd first like to provide a quick snapshot of CSA Group. Um, CSA Group was established in 1919 as an engineering and infrastructure standards developer and has grown to become an accredited standards development organization in Canada and the U.S. And we've been developing infrastructure, product performance, health and safety standards, and certification for nearly 100 years. As you can see, CSA Group operates in three main areas. The first being standard development, where Hillary and I work within. As, and, and developing standards is actually the foundation of CSA Group. Developing and publishing standards help promote and understand and apply best practices as standards consolidate experts' knowledge and build consensus into a single document. The standards division of CSA also helped develop value-added supporting tools such as education, training, and implementation guidance documents. And these, these offerings help individuals apply and implement the standards that we develop. Secondly, and more notably or, or recognizable, we have a large product testing and certification group, which provides testing and certification services for electrical, mechanical, plumbing, gas products, and maybe more recognizable within Canada, certainly hockey helmets, construction work boots. Our certification marks are recognized in Canada, the U.S., and around the world. And lastly, we have a product performance and testing group, which tests the performance of consumer products and provides inspection and advisory services for retailers and manufacturers in Canada, the U.S., and globally. CSA's head offices are in Toronto, Ontario. We're a not-for-profit, membership-based association with offices in North America, Europe, and Asia. We have over 9,000 active expert members who work to develop more than 3,000 standards and codes in 54 different technology areas. Our technology areas are mainly divided between four categories of energy, fuel burning, sustainability, health, and safety. Over our history, we have worked with our members to develop and promote the effective use of standards that support trade, engineering infrastructure design, safety, health, and now most certainly sustainability. So today, we would like to discuss the reasons why transparency of environmental impacts of products matters in today's marketplace. We will begin with a background on the methods and processes that are used to measure and communicate environmental impacts of products. This includes a description of life cycle assessment, or LCA, product category rules, or PCRs, environmental product declarations, or EPDs, and as well, program operators. We will then provide more details on the ways that environmental product declarations are being used in today's marketplace, including the new credits that are now being provided under LEEDS version four for green buildings. So here's a quick overview of the items that we'll look to cover during today's presentation. So similar to the course description I just provided, we will begin by discussing the learning objectives of today's presentation to give you a high level understanding of the key ideas that we hope you take away from today. We'll then discuss the reasons why transparency of environmental impacts of products matters in today's marketplace. And this will be a broad overview to provide context as to why PCRs and EPDs are important and gaining momentum. The next section provides the necessary background information to ensure that you understand the methods and processes that are used to measure and communicate environmental impacts of products. This includes the detailed discussion of, of life cycle assessment, product category rules, and environmental product declarations. And don't worry, by the end of the presentation, hopefully all these acronyms will, will make sense to you. Lastly, oh sorry, we'll then provide uh, more details on the ways that environmental product declarations are being used in today's marketplace, including the new material and resource credits in LEED version four, which was released last fall in the US and is coming to Canada in the summer of 2014. And finally, lastly, we will end with a question and answer session. So if you do have questions during the presentation today, please do send them to the moderator through the webinar, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. And those that we can't get to will respond uh, directly through email. By the end of today's presentation, we hope that you have a basic understanding of the life cycle assessment, product category rules, and EPDs. You should also understand the role of program operators in this process. 
And lastly, we hope you'll take away a better understanding of key drivers and market needs for the use of EPDs. So as you know, the marketplace is competitive and claims of product superiority can tip the scales in one manufacturer's favor. This includes claims of environmental superiority. Consumers are interested now in knowing the environmental impacts of products for several reasons, and quite simply, it's, it's competitive. Building owners, for example, that are interested in buying products today that have less environmental impact during their use phase, as this can potentially save them money. For example, light bulbs that use less energy not only help the environment, but also save the building owner money on electricity bills, leading to tangible cost savings. Transparency matters also to reduce risk. As we are at a time where there is a looming price on carbon, several retailers are interested in buying and selling products that use less energy and thus are less likely to increase in cost if a price on carbon was introduced in the market. Therefore, having transparency through EPDs, organizations can reduce their potential risks and better understand the environmental impacts of their products that they purchase. Lastly, customers themselves are interested in purchasing environmentally preferable products because it fits within their company or broader sustainability strategy, which again then helps differentiate themselves from their competitors. So with the increasing use of environmental claims and green labels and the search for environmental preferable products, how do consumers know that the environmental claims and labels that are used in today's marketplace are accurate and trustworthy? ISO, or the International Organization for Standardization, has developed a series of environmental labeling standards to address these issues. These are the ISO 14020 series of standards, and CSA Group is proud to hold the International Secretariat for the development of these standards. Based on ISO standards, environmental labels can be classified into three broad categories, type one, type two, and type three labels. Knowing the difference between these broad categories can help consumers navigate the variety of claims being made. To start off with, type one labels are labels that you see most frequently on consumer products, and they indicate that a product has met a specific environmental performance. Energy Star and the CSA Sustainability Mark are good examples of type one labels. Type two labels are environmental claims made for goods and services by the producer and are referred to as self-declared labels. For example, a cleaning product labeled as environmentally friendly or a package labeled as recyclable are both examples of self-declared claims. Now, it's important to note that there are actually no procedures for external groups to verify that type two label claims are accurate. Lastly, the focus of today's presentation, ISO 14025 describes type three labels. And the type three labels are better referred to as environmental product declarations. EPDs are science-based environmental labels indicating the environmental impact of a product throughout its life cycle. Consumers can then use EPDs to compare the environmental impacts of products that they're interested in purchasing. EPDs are therefore based on the results of life cycle assessment studies, which quantify environmental attributes. EPDs and the LCAs that contribute to the declarations are third party verified. It is this label that we're gonna be discussing in more detail today, including how the label is produced and verified. On the bottom of the screen, you will see two types of EPD labels that you will find on these declarations and related promotional material. The first is from the International EPD System in Sweden, and the second is from CSA Group. As EPDs are most commonly used in procurement and other business to business purpose, purposes, these labels are not often used on the product itself, unlike type one labels. So increasingly, EPDs are being requested by consumers in the supply chain, including in new bid requirements. They're also being incorporated into environmental rating systems such as LEED version four. And the rest of the presentation will help you understand how the labels that are developed and will provide you with details on how they're used, especially in relation to LEED version four. So before we get too far into today's presentation, it's important for us to have an understanding of, of LCA itself to help tailor the presentation to everyone's needs 
we'd like to take a minute to get an understanding of your knowledge. So with Michelle's help, oh, apologies, I'm going too far here. With Michelle's help, we'd like to conduct a quick survey and we'd like to get a sense on, on a scale of one to 10, how you would rate your knowledge of life cycle assessment, one being no knowledge and 10 being an expert. And secondly, have you ever seen an LCA report? Yes or no. And lastly, have you ever conducted an LCA itself? Yes or no. So we'll give everyone a minute to, to conduct this quick quiz and, and with Michelle's help, we'll be able to display the results. So it looks like Michelle has the quiz or the, or the questionnaire open now. Dan, for the first one on a scale of one to 10. Pardon me? Um, not much knowledge at all for the LCAs. Okay. And the majority did not see, have ever seen an LCA report. Okay. And almost everyone has not conducted an LCA. Okay, great. So apologies uh, that we couldn't see the, uh, the results on screen, but that does give us a bit of a context to move forward from. Um, so with that, I think what I'll do is I'll pass it over to my colleague here, Hillary Davies. To, uh, to get a little bit more in depth into um, what is a life cycle assessment and, and, and more detail into EPDs and PCRs. So thanks, Michael, and thank you for everyone for joining us today. Uh, based on the results of the quiz that um, Michelle was just able to, to put up and you were able to respond to, we, were, we appreciate your input because it helps us uh, gauge, like Mike said, an understanding of uh, the people that are participating on the call to make sure that everybody's getting the information they need. So life cycle assessments themselves are fundamental to your understanding of environmental product declarations. So that's where we'll start. Life cycle assessments or LCAs are science-based studies that evaluate the environmental impact of a product overall or select stages of its life cycle. This can include extraction of raw materials from the earth, transportation of raw materials to the factory, manufacture of the product up at the factory, transportation of the product from the factory to the store, the product used by the consumer and disposal or recycling at the end of at the product life. And that's what the illustration on the screen shows you are just those uh, basic steps that I just went through. But let's take an example of a light fixture uh, so you can understand how these life cycle stages might uh, be applied. So here we have our light fixture. Some of the applicable stages for a life cycle might include, first of all, the extraction of the materials from the earth, such as the mining of the nickel for the fixture and the copper for the wiring. Then it would require the transportation of these raw materials, the nickel and the copper, to the factory, or there might be multiple factories if they're produced at different locations. After that, we would take the production of the various parts of the fixture, for example, the metal of the fixture plus the wiring for the electrical connection and the final assembly of these parts at the factory. If the parts are made at different factories and assembled at a, another factory, there would also be at least one other transportation step in this life cycle. Once this part is done, we would look at transportation from the manufacturing plant to the distributor and then transportation to the store from the distributor. As a fifth step, we'd use the light fixture during its lifetime and measure those impacts. And then finally, the end of life of the light fixture would be evaluated including reuse of the fixture or recycling of the various parts or disposal of all or part of it in a landfill. In an LCA or a life cycle assessment, the environmental impacts are calculated for each stage of the life cycle. The impacts evaluated can vary, but may include such items as water use, energy use, production of toxic substances, and the quantity of raw materials used. You can see by the previous example of the light fixture that the life cycles of some products can be quite complex, especially when there are multiple parts and suppliers involved. Life cycle assessment broadly assesses a product's environmental impacts by first creating an inventory of the relevant energy and material inputs and the environmental releases, and then evaluating the potential impacts of these identified inputs and releases. Sorry, just having some technical difficulties here. There's a little bit of a delay. There we go. Two international standards guide the implementation of life cycle assessment. ISO 14,040, which provides the principles and framework for life cycle assessment, and ISO 14,044, 
which provides the requirements and guidelines for life cycle assessment. The key to these standards is that they provide guidance for life cycle assessment practitioners. However, they don't specify or standardize specific methodologies to be used. Well, how is this actual uh, LCA information used? It can be used actually for several purposes. Often these results are used to help the manufacturer make more informed decisions regarding how to reduce the environmental impact of the product over its life cycle. Sometimes the areas where the greatest amount of environmental impact occurs, which is often called hotspots, are not obvious. However, conducting a life cycle assessment can help identify these areas of greatest impact. Manufacturers can then target these hotspots to achieve greater environmental improvements. Life cycle assessment results can also be communicated to customers along the supply chain. In the case of manufacturers, they may want this information from their suppliers of parts so that they can choose components that result in a final product with less environmental impacts. For example, a publisher may be interested in knowing the recycled content of the paper it buys to manufacture its books, as well as the toxins released during the paper processing and the GHGs emitted. They may choose manufacturers with reduced impacts so that they can claim their product is more environmentally friendly. Other companies might be interested in having a better understanding of the impacts of the finished goods they buy and use, as is, as is in the case of green procurement. As we mentioned before, more companies are trying to live up to a green image and are doing so in part by requesting this information from their suppliers. So to look at how life cycle assessment information uh, can be used and how you could compare similar information uh, for multiple products, we're gonna use an example. So for this example, you're gonna consider the design and construction of a building. As a building designer or builder, you're interested in having more information about the environmental impacts of the products available, so you can make more informed choices about those uh, pieces that will go, be going into the building. You're considering three different roofing tiles for which the manufacturers provide some information about their environmental impacts. How would you select tiles based on this information? So just one second, the information will pop up on your screen. There we go. So as you can see on the screen, the first manufacturer provides information on the greenhouse gas emissions, water use and raw material use during the raw material extraction and material processing phases. The second manufacturer provides information on greenhouse gas emissions from material processing to the end of life. And the third manufacturer provides information on water use and the production of toxic substances during material processing and manufacturing and distribution phases. So as you can see, it would be difficult to compare the environmental impacts of these roofing tiles and thus make a decision as the information provides varies in two ways. First of all, the stages of the life cycle that are covered are different. Some only cover the manufacturing process while others include the use and end of life stages. The types of environmental impacts covered are also different. Some include greenhouse gas emissions, others include water use, and yet others provide information on the production of toxic substances. Uh, this lack of comparability and the desire to actually have uh, comparable life cycle assessment results is where product category rules or PCRs come in. So before we get into the details of what product category rules or PCRs are, we're going to take a minute to have another quiz. So if you could respond to the following questions, which I think Michelle will, uh, will post up in an interactive manner in a second, there's three questions. On a scale of one to 10, how would you rate your knowledge of product category rules? One being one, no knowledge, 10 being expert. Secondly, have you ever seen a PCR? Yes or no? And lastly, have you ever used a PCR to conduct a life cycle assessment or develop an environmental product declaration? Yes or no? So we'll let Michelle take over and uh, allow you the opportunity to respond to those questions. Sorry, Michelle, you cut out for a second. Can you say that again? I said I was showing you the results for you. 
Okay, now we have it. I think there's just a little bit of, do, of a delay on our end. So we can see uh, there's 63% of people have very little knowledge about product category rules. Um, there's a couple of people that have low, low to medium knowledge and some people uh, that have more moderate knowledge and very few that, uh, that consider themselves uh, an expert. It looks like a majority as an 86% has never seen a PCR. Okay, that's good to know. And there you go. Oh, perfect. Thank you. More not seen it. Okay, that, that's really good to know. We appreciate you taking the time to do this. Like we said, it helps us uh, make sure that we're on the right track. We know there's a variety of knowledge um, levels out there, so we apologize for the people who are pros at this, but please bear with us. So for those of you, which it seems to be the majority that uh, have very little or no understanding of what product category rules, this section will address that. So product category rules, or you might have heard them called PCRs, are specific rules or requirements and guidelines for developing environmental product declarations. So then that's the definition that's uh, used in ISO 1425, which is the international standard that uh, stipulates the requirements for environmental product declarations. Essentially, product category rules, or PCRs, are the standard for how to conduct a life cycle assessment and prepare an environmental product declaration for a particular product category. Product categories are often based on similar functions or components. For example, let's consider a product category that covers tiles, flagstones, bricks, and similar articles of cement, concrete, and artificial stone. So the PCR for this product category would cover all products and stipulate the declared unit. The declared unit in the case of this product category rule is the unit of comparison for which the products are evaluated. In this case, the functional unit is one ton of finished product. The product category rule also identifies the scope and boundaries of the life cycle assessment for the product category. This includes determining the life cycle stages covered. For example, will the life cycle assessment include only the extraction and manufacturing phases, or will it include the use phase? What about the end of life? Will that be included? In our experience as a program operator, these are questions that are often asked. Let's look again at the PCR for tiles example. So the diagram on the screen shows the boundaries of the life cycle assessment that are used in this product category rule. As you can see, all life cycle stages are covered from raw material extraction to product manufacturing, installation, and end of, the, end of life. This is often referred to as cradle to grave. The PCR or product category rule also outlines what environmental impacts are to be measured in the life cycle assessment. This can include water use, greenhouse gas emissions, the amount of raw material used, and toxic substances released. Some impacts may not be included as they are considered insignificant for the product in comparison to the other impacts. The goal of the product category rule is to include the impacts that have significant environmental effects to ensure that these are measured and subsequently communicated in the environmental product declaration. In the PCR for tile example, the parameters include, amongst others, renewable and non-renewable resource use, water use, greenhouse gas emissions, ozone depleting gas emissions, and hazardous waste. Product category rules are important as they help standardize the life cycle assessment for a particular product category. There are other key roles to help guide the development of environmental product declarations or EPDs for a particular product. We're now going to revisit the scenario we looked at earlier. And that's the one where we were trying to decide what roofing tiles to purchase. However, this case is a little different than the one we looked at before. This time, a product category rule was available for all three types of roofing tiles, which the manufacturers used to guide their life cycle assessment. As you can see by the diagram, life cycle assessment now covers all of the life cycle stages from cradle to grave and evaluates three key environmental impacts, greenhouse gas emissions, water use, and raw material use. So it's the PCR, the product category rule, that determines what stages of the life cycle are covered, as well as the type of environmental impacts that are measured in the life cycle assessment study. 
With this information at hand for each product, you, the purchaser, are able to compare the environmental impacts in these three categories over the same life cycle and are able to make a more informed decision regarding which roofing tile to purchase. Increasingly, product manufacturers are making this type of information available to their customers. But we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Before we get into those details, we need to talk about program operators. According to ISO 1425, again, that international standard that uh, stipulates the requirements for environmental product declarations, program operators are a body or bodies that conduct a type three environmental declaration program. In this case, body or bodies refers to a company such as CSA group or a group of companies, industrial sector or trade association, public authority or agency or independent scientific body. As a program operator, it's our role to develop product category rules and publish environmental product declarations in accordance with the international standard ISO 1425. The procedures we use to ensure that we meet this standard are documented in our program operator rules or general program instructions. Each program operator must have their own program operator rules. As program operators, both Earthshore and CSA Group have created their own program operator rules. So on the screen, you'll see in a minute, are copies of the front pages of both of these. Uh, the, sorry, the first one is Earthshore's Environmental Product Declarations General Program Instruction. And then you'll see CSA Group's program operator rules. These rules are available to the public, often by download on the program operator's website or by request. In relation to PCRs, program operators are responsible for facilitating a transparent development and review process. This includes ensuring the selection of competent members for the PCR development group and PCR review panel. We'll talk about the product category rule development process in a minute. Program operators are responsible for publishing the product category rules that we develop and maintaining a publicly available list of these documents. We also publish environmental product declarations that meet the requirements of the relevant product category rule the International Standard ISO 1425, and the Program Operator Rules. We ensure that the environmental product declarations are publicly available and that they are up to date. One of the key questions we get is how we find PCRs for your product. If you're interested in seeing if a PCR exists for a particular product, the best way to search, the best place to start your search is on GEDNET's website. GEDNET is an organization comprised of a number of global program operators. These program operators post their product category rules on GEDNET's website, which is accessible to the public. So as you can see from the snapshot on the slide, you can search for product category rules by category or by country. Many individual program operators also post PCRs on their websites, although the way in which they post information varies. It's important to note that product category rules are like standards, and they need to be updated on a regular basis to ensure that they are relevant to the current industry practices. When you are looking for a PCR to use, it's important to see when it was last updated and if it's still valid. Typical validity periods are three to five years. This information should be posted on the PCR itself and may also be posted in the summary on the program operator's website. On the slide is an excerpt from a PCR for cement. As you can see, the PCR was approved on September 15th, 2010 and is valid until May 16th, 2018. The validity period for this product category rule may be longer than the typical five-year period as it may have already undergone revision since the original approval date. Most program operators will also be willing to help you find product category rules for your particular products if you're having trouble finding one. However, if no appropriate product category rule exists, program operators can either work to adapt an existing product category rule or create a new one. However, again, PCRs are like standards. There should only be one product category or rule for a product category, as long as a scope, functional unit, and other pertinent details are appropriate. As a program operator, it's our responsibility to work together to ensure that product category rules are harmonized and to prevent unnecessary duplication. When new product category rules are required, we ensure that they're developed in accordance with the international standard of ISO 1425. There are cases when PCRs may need to be adapted if the scope or parameters do not fit the needs of the industry. And that's what we had talked about earlier where the scope might be slightly different. The standard does specify the development of the PCR must include the consultation of interested parties 
and that product category rules must be reviewed by a panel of at least three individuals with expertise in related areas. Once the PCR is reviewed by the committee and any required issues have been addressed, the PCR will be ready for the industry to use. The program operator will publish the PCR on the website. This process is can be different between different program operators, uh, but this is this is a general process that uh, that you will find. And again, PCRs are reviewed on a regular basis, usually three to five years, to ensure that they reflect any changes in the industry. So recently, a global initiative emerged to help increase the consistency of product category rules created by program operators. The PCR Guidance Development Initiative that you can see on your screen worked with a number of program operators, including CSA Group, Lifecycle Assessment Consultants, and other interested stakeholders to develop a document to guide the creation of product category rules at international level. This document provides more guidance than the detailed international standard ISO 1425. The first version of this document was released last August after a public review period facilitated by CSA Group. It's hoped that the program operators will incorporate this guidance into their program operator rules as CSA Group has done to ensure more consistency of PCRs and thus increase the comparability of environmental product declarations based on these documents. And now it's time for one last uh, knowledge check. So this time we're going to be looking at environmental product declarations and then we'll launch into the environmental product declaration section. So again, I'll just post the three questions. They're very similar. So one to 10, your knowledge of EPDs. Uh, have you ever seen an EPD and have you ever developed one? So we'll pass it over for Michelle to uh, post that interactively and then we'll look at the results together. Great, thanks Michelle. So it looks like on a scale of one to 10, most people have very little, half the people have uh, basically no knowledge or very little. 32% have low to moderate and 13% uh, have, have, I would say, about moderate knowledge. And it looks like, again, very similar to the past for life cycle assessment and EPDs that there are some people who are either experts or uh, have quite a bit of knowledge. Just waiting for, oh, there we go. The second question, have you ever seen an EPD? Uh, about a third of the people have, have seen an EPD, which is great. So hopefully when we talk about those in the next section, you'll have some understanding. Uh, but the majority of people, or two thirds, have not seen an EPD. So we'll get to that in a second. That's great to know. And the last question is in regards to development and of, of an environmental product declaration. And we're just waiting for the results of that to come up. And 4% uh, of the people have developed an EPD or environmental product declaration, and most of the people, 96, have not. So, uh, again, apologies moving forward for those people who are uh, experts in this area, but uh, we'll assume that because most people don't have that information, that we'll go back to the very basics. So I guess this is the moment that you've all been waiting for. This is uh, to learn about what environmental product declarations or EPDs are all about. So EPDs, or Environmental Product Declarations, are documents that communicate a product's environmental impact over a specified portion of its life cycle. They are developed in accordance with product category rules, or PCRs, and that international standard, ISO 1425, and use life cycle assessment data. The specific stages of the life cycle that are covered in the EPD, as well as the environmental attributes that are measured and reported on, are specified in the product category rule for which it is based. So let's look at an example of an environmental product declaration to illustrate the various key components. As previously mentioned, the environmental product declaration can cover all or portions of the life cycle of the product as directed by the product category rule. In this example of roof tiles, the EPD covers the entire life cycle of the product from raw material extraction to the end of life. The upstream category covers the raw material extraction, the core module covers the production of the tile, and the downstream module covers the roof tile's use and end of life. The environmental product declaration also specifies the functional unit that's used to calculate all of the impacts declared in the environmental product declaration. This functional unit, as specified by the product category rule on which the EPD is based, is one ton, 
the one unit ton of roof tiles. So by specifying the functional unit and the stages of the life cycle to be covered, the ability to compare the impacts of the product as detailed in the environmental product declaration is increased. The EPD also covers various parameters as defined in the product category rule. In this case, the parameters include, amongst others, global warming potential related to GHG emissions, ozone depletion potential, eutrophication, acidification, renewable and non-renewable energy resource use. As you can see from the excerpt on the slide, it looks very similar to a nutrition label on food products. The environmental product declaration provides information in the following categories which we just discussed, and you can look at with a little bit more detail uh, if you look at an EPD itself. They're based on scientific information uh, on the environmental aspects of the product as reported through the life cycle assessment of the product. They do not declare environmental superiority to other products, and they are not green marks. EPDs are primarily used in business-to-business -business applications where the buyer wants to know the environmental impacts of the product that they are purchasing. So now you know what environmental product declarations are, we'll discuss how they're developed. So the first step in developing an environmental product declaration is to find an appropriate product category role for the product. This may require working with a program operator to develop one if none exists, as we talked about earlier. Once an appropriate PCR is found or developed, a life cycle assessment expert Oops, sorry, I think I, uh, sorry, I think I missed my notes there for a second. So we're talking about EPDs. Oh, no, we were right, sorry. Sorry about that, my, my mistake. Uh, so the, as previously mentioned, the PCR dictates the scope of the life cycle assessment that the life cycle, that is the life cycle stages and the environmental impacts that are included, as well as the functional unit that is the unit of, that the life cycle assessment measures. This could be a square foot of carpet, one toilet, etc. I think I'm just out of. I think I'm just missing a slide. That's okay. We'll just we'll keep going on here. The life cycle assessment results are then used to develop an environmental product declaration. This can be done by the manufacturer if they have in-house expertise, or can be done by an external consultant. The EPD and LC are then submitted to an independent body to verify. The LCA and EPD are verified against the product category rule and the international standard ISO 1425. Program operators are responsible for ensuring that the verifiers meet the requirements as laid out in ISO 1425. Different program operators achieve this in different ways. For example, we accept environmental product declarations that have been verified by an organization that has been certified by an accredited organization, as well as from individuals that have demonstrated that they meet the requirements of ISO 1425. We then post this list of pre-approved verifiers on our website and allow manufacturers to choose the verifiers they, work, they wish to work with by contacting them directly. This removes any potential conflict of interest that may occur if the program operator were to select the verifier. The EPD and verification report are then submitted to the program operator for publication and registration. Many program operators provide a label for the manufacturer to use on the EPD document, as well as to use on marketing materials such as product fact sheets and websites. The EPD is often posted on the program operator's website and may be given a unique registration number as we do. The EPD is valid for a specified period of time, often between three and five years, after which point it must be updated. The EPD must also be updated if changes in the manufacturing process cause the environmental impacts to significantly change. So now we'll talk briefly about EPD verification. That's Sorry, I'll just take one second to click through these. Independent verification of the environmental product declaration and the life cycle assessment and other supporting data used to create the EPD is a very important step in the creation and registration of EPDs. ISO 1425 stipulates that the information must be verified by an independent group, but does not necessarily have to be done by a third party. The standard also requires that the program operator ensures that the verifier meets minimum competencies allowed outlined in the standard. Program operators have different ways of ensuring that the verification is done in a way that meets these requirements. For example, we invite potential verifiers to apply in advance of performing verification activities. 
review their application to ensure that they meet the requirements outlined in 1425, the ISO standard, and post those that qualify on our website. These people are given the designation of recognized verifier. The image on the slide is a screenshot showing the start of the list of recognized verifiers that we have on the website. By posting this information, companies that are interested in having an EPD verified can view the list of recognized verifiers and choose one with whom they are comfortable. So why should you develop an environmental product declaration or EPD? The use of PCRs and EPDs is commonplace in Europe and has been for several years. Countries, including France, have been investigating the use of programs that would require products sold in their country to have EPDs for several years. This includes one program resulting from the Grinnell law in France, which requires products sold in the country to have an EPD. They're currently evaluating their pilot project and will make a decision on the next step shortly. Of note is that they are especially interested in having EPDs for construction and decoration products and have been preparing a measure to establish an official framework for EPDs on these products. Many European manufacturers have started to produce EPDs as part of the pilot in anticipation of this regulation, as have some North American manufacturers who sell products in France. The government of Canada recently revised their federal sustainable development strategy, which includes a requirement for life cycle assessments to be conducted for new building construction. Retailers are also increasing, increasingly looking at the environmental impacts of the products that they sell. For example, Walmart has been investigating the use of EPDs and evaluating potential suppliers for several years. They have funded a group called the Sustainability Consortium to look into ways of simplifying the EPD process with the aim of requesting this information from their suppliers. Many manufacturers are also using EPDs to differentiate themselves from their competitors. By developing EPDs, they are able to showcase their environmental efforts to their customers, thus providing them with a competitive edge. Another benefit of developing environmental product declarations is that they allow you to identify hotspots or areas of most environmental impact in a product's life cycle. Sometimes these impacts are not intuitive. Manufacturers can use the information revealed by the EPD to make process improvements that help the environment and also may save them money. And finally, in the new version of LEED, that's version 4, project teams can earn points or credits for using products that have environmental declarations. This is one of the biggest drivers for the development and registration of EPDs in North America. So before we get into the details of LEED, just want to talk quickly about uh, some areas where EPDs already exist. So building and construction is a very key area. As you can see on the screen, there's EPDs for polystyrene panels insulation, wood particle board, windows, concrete bath blocks, bathtubs, and many, many more. Also furniture and flooring, especially carpets, are two areas where the number of EPDs seem to have exploded. Electronics and appliances are also an expanding sector for EPDs. In particular, there's smartphones, printers, TVs, and again, many, many more. Trends I've mentioned so far apply worldwide. However, there are some sectors that are more popular in certain parts of the world. This includes food, especially those that are processed, that seems to be expanding in Europe. And we've also seen this take place in North America as well. As well, there's areas in terms of transportation and energy generation where we're seeing EPDs. So at this point, we're going to pass the uh, presentation back to Tara from Elixir Environmental, who will explain more about LEED version 4 and environmental product declarations. Okay, thanks, Hillary. That was great information. Um, Okay, so some of the biggest changes coming to LEED version 4 are in the materials and resources category and are really focused on this idea of increasing product transparency. Now, in trying to come up with the new MR credits, the MR Technical Advisory Group, or TAG, looked at LEED 2009 and asked questions like, what is most important in terms of environmental impacts? So is it recycled content? Is it rapidly renewable resources? The bottom line was that the TAG found it was really hard to analyze the 2009 MR credits as to what truly has the biggest environmental impact because there simply were not enough data available. And while LEED 2009 really emphasized reducing operational energy to reduce CO2 and other greenhouse gases, 
it turns out that up to about 35% of the total impact from buildings is actually related to the materials used on a project. And of course, as we get better at reducing our operational impacts, then the relative contribution of materials increases. So we know that materials are an important contributor to environmental impacts. We just don't know how they contribute. So at the heart of this push for increased product transparency is this need to increase and improve our data stream. And the most comprehensive way that we have to collect such data is via life cycle assessment. Now, LEED version 4 has incorporated LCA into the rating system as a means to not only learn more about the materials and products that we use in buildings, but also to encourage more informed decision making by design professionals and hopefully to improve the environmental and health performance of building products through innovations by manufacturers. Okay, so there are actually three new MR credits that directly relate to product transparency. And they all fall under the umbrella of building product disclosure and optimization, which indicates that there is both a disclosure or transparency aspect to each credit, as well as an optimization or improvement part. Okay, so this credit, Environmental Product Declarations, is specifically looking for declaration of a product's environmental performance. Now, the intent of this credit is to encourage the use of products and materials with available lifecycle data and with improved lifecycle impacts. Now, again, there's both a disclosure and optimization aspect to this credit, but for the sake of today's presentation, let's look strictly at the first option. Okay, so for option one, the disclosure part, the project must use at least 20 permanently installed products from at least five different manufacturers that meet one of four different disclosure criteria. Now, the first is having a publicly available, critically reviewed, product-specific life cycle assessment with at least a cradle-to-gate scope. Now, a product with this type of disclosure counts as only one quarter of a product for the purposes of credit achievement calculations which means that if a project team uses products with only LCAs, they would actually need 80 products to fulfill this requirement. The second type of disclosure is an industry-wide or generic EPD. So to be able to use this type of EPD, a manufacturer must be recognized by the program operator as a participant in the development of that EPD. A product with this type of disclosure counts as only one half of a product so a project team focusing on this type of disclosure would need 40 products to fulfill this requirement. The next option is more along the lines of what Hillary was discussing, and that is a product-specific type 3 EPD. So products with this type of disclosure count as a whole product for credit calculation purposes. So only the base 20 products would be needed to fulfill this requirement if all of them had a product-specific EPD available. And this last criteria listed here is just to allow for any other types of declarations that might become available in the future that meet similar levels of disclosure. So the point here is that the product-specific EPD will likely be the type of disclosure most requested by design professionals and specifiers from manufacturers, um, since this is the one that will be most valuable to lead project teams. <clears throat> okay, so. Now that you're somewhat familiar with how transparency is being encouraged by LEED version 4, I'll mention that several of the top design firms in the U.S. have already issued statements to manufacturers that they will no longer even consider specifying products that don't have transparency documentation, including an environmental product declaration. So here we're seeing how design professionals are already starting to drive the market towards increased transparency. Okay, and with that, I will turn the mic back over to Hillary and Michael to finish up. Thanks, Tara, for that. That was really um, informative for us, especially in regards to lead. So just to wrap up, there's a couple of key points that we want to make sure that you take away from this presentation. First off, they are that PCRs are like standards. I know we've mentioned those that quite a few times, but this is really important. They standardize the way life cycle assessments are conducted for similar products and the way that this information is communicated in an environmental product declaration. PCRs are developed by program operators and are reviewed by experts in the field. 
Whenever possible, product category rules or PCRs should be harmonized so that only one PCR exists for a product. The second is that EPDs summarize the environmental impact of a product over its life cycle. Customers may use this information to compare the environmental impacts of similar products. Manufacturers can use this information to market the sustainability of their product. However, it's important to remember that EPDs are not a claim of environmental superiority. Thirdly, program operators work with manufacturers and industry associations to develop product category rules and register EPDs for environmental product declarations based on the international standard ISO 1425 and their own program operator rules. Program operators must maintain a publicly available list of their PCRs and EPDs, and many program operators meet this requirement by providing those documents on their website, which can be downloaded by interested parties. And lastly, there are several drivers that are increasingly used for the EPDs in North America. As Tara just discussed, EPDs count. Uh, there are points for, for EPDs in the new version of LEAD in the new LEAD version 4, and they're also being used as a marketing tool to demonstrate the reduced impact of environmentally preferable products. While EPDs are not currently mandated in regulation, there is a movement in Europe and Canada to develop requirements for EPDs or carbon footprints. So at this point, we'll turn it over to Michelle, and I think she'll probably have a couple of uh, questions for the three of us to answer. So thank you very much for your participation, and uh, hopefully you found some or all of this informative. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hillary and Tara and Michael. It was great. This does conclude our presentation for today, and we are open for questions that you might have for them. Um, I do have a couple that have come in here. It looks like there's two, one from Sarah and one from David. They're pretty much asking the same thing. Um, if a manufacturer develops an ETD in accordance with a P PCR, but internally verifies the results and does not register the ETD, with the program operator, is this a type three EPD? So I'll, I'll take a stab at that. We might need to get a little bit more information. From what I heard, it was a manufacturer um, that develops an EPD and internally verifies it. I assume that means their own uh, their own staff, and then they don't want to register it. And the question is, would we view it as, or view it as a type three? Is that correct, Michelle? That is correct. Okay. So in that case, um, the program operator wouldn't actually have any kind of involvement in that. The, the role of the program operator is actually to uh, to to basically register an EPD and to make sure that all the requirements of ISO 1425, which are the international standard, as well as the requirements that the program operator has specified for themselves, are met. Uh, and then most program operators will give then a label saying that uh, they basically uh, can show that these requirements have been met. Uh, but if they're not interested in uh, registering an EPD with a with a program operator, then uh, then for us that for a program operator that would have uh, the no involvement from us. We're we're not um, a policing body. We just uh, would be involved in in with manufacturers and EPDs uh, that wanted to be registered with us. Uh, now, Tara could probably talk a little bit more about acceptance of those EPDs, maybe from a lead version 4 perspective. My understanding is that they would have to be compliant with ISO 1425 to be recognized by um, by organizations like LEAD uh, or programs like LEAD. And uh, also, I'm not sure how um, how much they would be accepted by other uh, other manufacturers along the supply chain, for example, but I actually haven't had any experience in that, so maybe Tara could, uh, could speak a little bit more to that if she has any kind of input on the lead aspect. Yeah, absolutely. I, lead does specifically reference um, the use of program operators um, to count as, as a type three environmental product declaration. Um, so I, I do believe that you would have to go through a program operator, um, and if there is a PCR already available for your type of product, um, then I don't know why you wouldn't. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's one more step. Um, and if you've already conducted the, the LCA, that's, that's really the heavy lifting has already been done. So, um, I, I do believe you need to go through a program operator. Um, lead, uh, USGBC is, uh, still working to, uh, kind of spell everything out and, and get everything clearly defined. So hopefully, um, by the second half of, of the year, they will have a little bit more detail, um, regarding the requirements. Um, for what constitutes a, a, an EPD that qualifies for the credit. 
Thank you. Kind of on that note, um, there's a question. Is there a list of PCR operators organizations in North America? Does the PCR library indicates no links? That's a good question. I'm not aware of any. I'm not sure if Michael or Tara has any information. Um, there might be a list that's uh, put out independently somewhere out there, and I'm not sure if uh, if Lead will maybe post one once it's uh, in the in the coming months. I'm not sure. I haven't uh, been aware of any, but maybe uh, if somebody else is aware of one, then maybe they would be willing um, to actually, share that. But as far as yeah, I'm aware, so, I'm sorry, Hillary. So the um, the PCR guidance no, group. No. Um, they actually have a list of program operators on their website. So if you go to PCRguidance.org, um, it's on the, the one of the navigation uh, menus at the top. It actually has a list of program operators that are recognized um, around the world, not just in North America. That's great. Thanks, sir. And can reclaim materials work with the standard, as in the EPD, LCA? I don't see why why they wouldn't. Basically, what the life cycle assessment does and uh, what's reported in the EPD is impacts of uh, of any component. Or the, for example, if you're looking at the light fixture like we had before, or if you're looking maybe uh, at reclaimed materials, maybe reclaimed wood for a coffee table, for example. If if the product category rule for a coffee table um, had impacts of uh, of the raw materials that are used, which would include the wood, for example, um, then you would still need to calculate the environmental impacts as specified in the product category rule for that for that reclaimed wood. Um, they would obviously have different environmental impacts than than a, like virgin wood, for example, um, but that would still be included. We are running a little bit long, but there's just a couple more questions. Um, can the same independent party who verified the the, the EPD also verify the LCA? Yes. Yeah. That yeah. Is. Very quick answer, but yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There's not many things that are clear in this in this area, but that is that is one of them. Okay. Now, um, just as a procedure. Um, question, and this was back earlier in the presentation, most people would throw an old light fixture in the garbage, irrespective of its recyclability. So I'm not understanding its recyclability. If consumers don't have a metal recycling program in the, in the area, then the potential is never realized. Is this factored into the EPD equations? Tara might be able to talk a little bit more about the actual um, uh, specifications in a life cycle assessment. So correct me if I'm wrong, Terry, but my understanding would be that when when you're doing a life cycle assessment, uh, there there are different databases you can use and, and different information you can pull from. And, and she could probably talk to whether those are averages and includes uh, probabilities or so forth. Um, so maybe Terry, you might be better posed to answer that than I am as an LCA expert. Right, absolutely. So um, uh, the, the potential for um, something to be recycled is definitely included um, in the calculation. So, for example, you know, glass is, is you know, pretty standard um, for people to recycle. Other things are not. But um, that's definitely taken into consideration. But unfortunately, it turns out that uh, a lot of PCRs don't even include disposal um, in, in the PCR. It's actually more of a cradle to gate. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of a lot of uh, EPDs don't even um, address uh, uh, that aspect um, unless the manufacturer chooses to it in their LCA. So, but yes, the, the the potential for recycling is is included where it's required by the PCR. And then, what um, catalyst is in place to end users to leverage? So, product manufacturers provide EPD LCAs as the norm. Um, can you read that one more time, Michelle? I'm, I'm not sure if I quite understand. I don't know. Yeah. Jason, if you're still with us, if we can get some verification. What catalyst is in place for end users to leverage so product manufacturers provide EPDs and LCAs as the norm? So basically, what is in place to make sure that they're being done? I think is what he's asking. Right now, there's there's no requirements for environmental product declarations. They're not in uh, legislation, for example. Um, but there are other drivers, like we talked to earlier. So one of them would be um, 
the requirement or the ability to gain uh, credits through lead version four, like Tara talked about. Uh, we're also seeing that, again, companies are doing this, uh, have been doing this way before lead version four came in. And those companies that were doing it were doing it for a number of reasons. Some were doing it because when uh, when they do it, they, they can basically showcase that they have environmentally um, preferable products, especially if they can show that over um, over time that they're improving in their process or that uh, when you compare theirs to other manufacturers, uh, they're being transparent about their impacts where others may not. Uh, so some people are using it in that respect. Others are doing it because they uh, they might be getting rumblings that this might be coming uh, as a requirement from other uh, large, man large retailers like Walmart and they're doing it in, in anticipation of uh, those requirements. Uh, or anticipation of uh, requirements in other countries like France uh, that they might export to. So again, there's there's no uh, legal requirements or regulatory requirements in North America uh, right now. It's called market-based driven. I'm not sure, Tara, if you want to add to that as well. No, I, th I think you covered it pretty well. Um, as I mentioned in my last slide, a number of, uh, of large artificial firms are um, will not even be al allowing manufacturers in their door to, to um, give lunch and learns or, or anything of the sort unless they have. Um, a lot of them are requesting uh, health product declarations, which are, are kind of complementary to these life cycle documents, um, but environmental product declarations as well. So you know, I think as we've seen in the past, once uh, you know, some of the large firms start, start making these um, demands, uh, it probably won't be long um, before the majority of, of the industry will follow suit. have a question. Where do we find ISO 14,025? Uh, you can find it in a number of different locations. Uh, it is a standard that you need to purchase. Um, you can find it on CSA's website. So we have a, a copy that you can um, you can purchase as a PDF online there. You can also find it directly from ISO's website again for purchase. Okay, and it looks like that does um, end all the questions, if there are any more that just want to come in. Um, just as a verification, is it fair to say that the PCRs are third-party verifiers of product declarations? Sorry, you're, Michelle, you're asking if the, the EPDs are third-party verified? The PCRs are party verifiers of product declaration, or EPDs, yes. Uh, I'm not sure quite what the what the, the question is. I think some things might have been blurred together. Maybe yeah. I'm not sure if you. Or, well, that might. Well, if if we're looking at PCRs specifically, I, I, we can confirm that PCRs are uh, approved by an expert panel of at least uh, three experts within that product category area. So PCRs are reviewed and 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 quote unquote verified. Uh, verified is not really. The, the most applicable word verification more relates to data and information of an LCA, but PCRs are vetted and approved by a, by an expert panel once they're developed. Okay. And then I think if if there if the question is actually more related to EPDs, because I think they're both kind of merged in there together, then EPDs are are verified too. They're uh, independently verified by uh, somebody different than the person who developed it, uh, and the LCA data that's involved in that as well. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, that does um, finish the question section. At any time, if you do have additional questions, please feel free to email us at webinars at greence.com. And just a quick reminder, if you did participate as a group today, please send off that presentation.